Okay, good afternoon. I hope your lunch was great. This is the last little stretch before you're going to fall asleep, so hopefully this doesn't aggravate that. Um, yeah, thank you. Welcome to B-Sides. Welcome to my talk. I'm grateful you decided to listen to me go on about stuff I like. Uh, hopefully I can show you how much I like this stuff. Uh, so let's dive into it. The title of my talk is going to be at Attacking Microsoft Exchange, uh, Fusing Light Neuron with Cobalt Strike. All three of those things sound unfamiliar to you. Hopefully at the end of this talk you'll know what all three of them are in, in painful detail. Um, so I'll start off with a little bit of detail, uh, a little bit about me. I'm going to say the word detail a lot. My name is Leon Jacobs, currently uh, CTO uh, for the SensePost team at Orange Cyber Defense. And I like hacking things and tools and security research and a whole bunch of stuff like that. So I'm generally interested the moment things are breaking. Some of the talks I saw this morning already has me a little giddy. Uh, that's, that's the space I'm curious about. So today, uh, I'm going to cover sort of three, three main things, but I'm going to do a lot of detail in that. There's the word detail again. Uh, I want to give some context first. What, what is this all about? Why, why are you here? Why am I telling you this? Then we're going to dive into a little bit of malware uh, in a thing called Light Neuron. Don't worry if you don't know what that is yet. I'm going to tell you. Uh, and then thirdly, a little bit of extra work that I did to extend that to include Cobalt Strike in, into Light Neuron. And the way I'm going to do that primarily is with a diagram. In fact, there's going to be a lot of diagrams. And I'm going to repeat itself a little bit because there's quite a few moving parts to this thing. Uh, so if you haven't seen a diagram yet, don't worry, there'll be, there'll be many. So we'll start off a little bit with, uh, with sort of this idea of, of MITRE, something you may have heard of before, purple teams, and finally the concept of a threat actor called Turla. Now MITRE, I guess in this community, probably most known for the attack framework, something you probably have heard of or continuously hear about, uh, you know, you're a vendor or a pen tester or a blue team or attack, attack, everything. But I don't know how many of you know, it's actually a 9,000 person corporate, uh, organization. Uh, and they do a lot of things, like a surprising amount of stuff in many different industries that, that we might not be familiar with. But one of the things MITRE does is this, this thing that they do yearly called an attack evaluation. Uh, and simply put, they sort of go, hey vendors, we want to play, play, be a bad guy. Uh, do you want to come and install your tooling on our play, play environments uh, and see how well you can detect these bad guys? Um, there are known bad guys, we, we know how they work because we ask the threat intelligence community before we do this, hey, what can you tell us about these bad guys, right? Uh, so the, this call for threat intelligence initially is sort of a way to set them up to go, let's do an attack evaluation round. And what you might see coming out of this are a bunch of tweets that vendors put out saying they've got 100% coverage and it becomes this measuring contest, when in reality it's not that. It's actually a little bit of a buyer's guide. If you're in the market for a security product, a security tool, you can go onto the attack evaluations results website and go and look at literally the dashboard. What did the thing look like that they used to detect some sort of technique or something like that? It's actually pretty cool once you don't look at Twitter anymore and dig into the detail. <laughs> this year, they decided to go with a third actor called Turla. Russian-based, you know, I'm going to use all of these words, but, uh, you know, put all the buzzwords in there, they, they fit the profile pretty well. Uh, and, and one part of Turla, what they did was they used a piece of malware called Light Neuron. And that's what we're going to focus on a little bit today. So to summarize all of that, this work comes from MITRE's uh, attack evaluations. They did Turla this year. Um, and, and part of the work that we do, you know, we like to do bubble teaming. So for us to emulate this threat actor, the, the stuff that they've done, uh, we would engage with a, with a client or a vendor in this case, and we would perform similar sort of attacks with, uh, with that client. Now, the really important part is, specific to Turla, like the light neuron malware, there's no get clone light neuron and you now have access to the malware. Some of those threat actor, uh, some of the pieces of code that they use is like not, not public knowledge. You, know, you, don't, you don't download it from the internet. So sometimes we have to innovate to try and emulate what some of those TDPs would be. This is going to be some of that work, emulating that exchange-specific backdoor, which we're going to talk about now. Now, one really important thing in knowing how these things work is we rely on really smart people that would do research on those things. They find this malware out in the wild, they reverse engineer it, they disassemble it, it sort of gives a really good idea on how these things function, end to end sometimes. Uh, for this talk, this work for the asset security uh, research team is genuinely amazing. Uh, it tells you a ton of stuff around how Turla operated and puts that into context with Light Neuron, the thing that I'm going to tell you about today. Some of the things, now I don't think you should spend 20 minutes reading the report, I'm going to tell you some of the cool stuff. 
Uh, a little bit about the Tula. You know, they're after defense organizations, government organizations, defense contractors. I highlighted 2014 there with RUAG, a Swiss defense company, aerospace defense company specifically. Uh, but those are the sort of people that they were after. In fact, Tola, in general, is interested after secret information or sort of doing espionage kind of, kind of stuff, uh, which, which is really interesting. You know, in terms of these people, it's high-profile attacks. It's not you know, things that we can shrug off. It's actually quite, uh, quite impactful. Continue reading this report, if my clicker works. There we go. Um, you also start learning a little bit that you know, while they're, they're sort of still around, they've actually been around for a really long time. There's theories that sort of a proto tool has existed as early as the 90s, with some compromises that happened with US, uh, US agencies. The second part that's really interesting is the use of light neuron, which is this backdoor we're going to talk about today. There's some evidence that suggests it exists from 2014. Now think about it, that's almost 10 years ago now. It doesn't feel like 10 years ago, but when you think about it next year, that's been a while. Uh, now, today I'm going to do a lot of Microsoft Exchange specific things. Uh, I'm not talking about the Unix version of this. Uh, there's no proof that it exists. However, those that have reverse engineered the malware have found plenty of references to other MTAs that exist in Unix systems. I'm going to show you a Microsoft-related one today, but just keep it in the back of your head that this is not isolated to just Microsoft Exchange. It's been targeting other, potentially targeting other, other mail transports as well. Okay, so that's a whole bunch of things about Turla, and that's probably going to be the end of it. The part we want to talk about is Light Neuron. So what is Light Neuron is a little bit of a 101. It's a backdoor. Uh, in this case, something that's implemented via a Microsoft Exchange transport agent. I'll show you what a transport agent is shortly. But that's sort of the guts of this thing. Uh, its abilities, again, you know, considering what Tola is after, they can spy on mail, they can modify mail, influence mail flow, uh, and, and like really do some crafty things with, uh, with that. And the second part that it sort of can do is to execute commands. Sounds rudimentary, uh, but it's really interesting to think you've got a command execution via an email coming in. We'll unpack that a little bit. One last important thing to keep in mind, this is a backdoor. So if you're thinking about a much larger attack chain, this is not the beginning of it. It's sort of towards the end of this actions and objective phase. Like by now, a ton of things have gone wrong. I'm <laughs> sorry to say. But they've managed to infect Exchange and install this backdoor. Like that's, that's a bad time. But from a defense perspective, you need to keep in mind, there's probably a ton of things that have and could have gone off by this time, by the time we get here. So what you need to keep in mind is at this point, someone's got significant access into a network, they've managed to infect an exchange server, and at this point, they're now using the stealthy backdoor, which, which I'll show you now. If you wanted to read a little bit more, there are two references from, from MITRE's website. But okay, to understand how this backdoor works, you won't be surprised, we need to start with a user. Uh, that user, of course, is how any security story goes, will send an email, uh, and that email, depending on where it goes, it maybe goes to a large corporate, will end up flowing through an exchange server. And at its most basic function, that email will get delivered to a mailbox, right? A Little bit of an email 101. Now, if it's my boss mailing me, I probably never get a reply, but sometimes people reply and the email will go the other way going back. If you're in a bad, uh, if you're having a bad time, this light neuron thing is part of the conversation. Some bad people may have come along and actually infected your exchange server with the malware that we're gonna talk about today. And that changes the picture just slightly. Now, like a user, an attacker, of course, uh, will also send an email, but this time around, instead of the mail potentially going directly to the mailbox, it now goes to this transport agent, which we'll unpack a little bit, and now sort of two, one of two choices can happen. Either the mail will get delivered directly into the mailbox, or there's some other post-processing that would occur. There might be some instruction that needs to be executed because of this special email that the attacker sent. At that point, optionally, an email can go back to the attacker with some information. Console output from a command, a file they may have downloaded, or whatever the story might be. And the bit you should start seeing happening here is all of this is just email up and down. An SMTP conversation happening to trans get these things going around. So like I said before, we're going to focus specifically on this light neurons uh, component. I don't know a lot about Exchange. You might not think that, but I really don't know. Uh, but I've played around with transport agents a little bit, and that's what I want to show you. Okay, so what's a transport agent? We're going to do a little bit of a 101 on how transport agents fit into, into the exchange world. And it's most simplistic way I can describe it. It's sort of like a pluggable mechanism for you to extend Microsoft Exchange. Believe it or not, security products could use transport agents. If you have an anti-spam product that you install, if you had on-prem exchange, 
they could install a transport agent, which now becomes part of the mail flow, to prevent that email from entering a mailbox because it's spammy. It applies for anti-malware, those very annoying subjects that say external email, don't click these links, or physically modifying the body to say, warning, you know, someone's probably trying to get your credit card info if you reply to this thing. If you were to install an exchange server and not do a lot of configuration, and you ran the PowerShell commandlet get transport agent, it would return a list that would look something like this. These would be an example of default transport agents that exist by design in Microsoft Exchange. You'll see DLP related things, anti-malware, you know, whatever the story might be. So the key thing is like transport agents are a core and necessary feature of Microsoft Exchange. This is not an optional thing that you, that you, that you can implement. Uh, it's a key design choice that Microsoft uses themselves. All right, so how does a transport agent work as far as mail flow goes? Well, we remember the user, they'll send an incoming message. And when a message comes in, at some point within Microsoft Exchange, transport in agents get invoked. And there are three types of transport agents that can be invoked. We get SMTP agents, routing agents, and delivery agents. The SMTP-related agent, as you potentially could imagine, is at SMTP time. A TCP connection occurs, a mail body needs to be downloaded from the mail server, uh, and at that point, the SMTP transport agent has done its job. It then moves over to routing agents. Where do I route within the exchange organization this message? And finally, that email needs to be delivered into a mailbox. So it's not as simple as the mail enters exchange and it just delivers. There's a ton of processing that needs to happen in the middle. That's not the end of it, though. Uh, we're going to focus on an SMTP receive agent specifically. But with these agents, there are events that you can listen on. And this is almost the end of the hard part. The events in SMTP um, agents, the SMTP receive agents, uh, are the ones that are really interesting if you wanted to implement your own agent. You, with code, can listen on some events and decide to make some choices on something based on these events. There are many, we're not gonna go through the list of them, but the one we're really interested in over here is the on end of data event. Quite literally, it means the SMTP conversation is now done. The entire message has now been received by Microsoft Exchange. I've got the headers, I've got the body, the attachment, the entire thing. The event fires on the end of all of that data. So you've 100% guaranteed that at this point, within the Microsoft Exchange stack, I've got a full message that I can work with. Okay, that's all you need to know about a transport agents, believe it or not. I was at this point myself where I realized, cool, I'm ready for this thing. What's the best thing I can do next is Google some documentation. And I was hoping I'm gonna find the three easy steps to build a transport agent. <laughs> the Microsoft documentation isn't great if you didn't catch the humor over there. Uh, in fact, uh, I'll show you exactly what they show you. They show you a little bit of context on what I just described, a little bit more verbose and probably technically more correct, uh, but the point is the same. But the part I wanted now is the code. I wanna implement this transport agent. So helpfully, the documentation starts with import some libraries, okay? That's very simple. There's a 20 minute story on how it's not. The second step is cool. Just implement this thing called an SMTP receive agent factory, uh, and you need to resolve for create agent. All right, not sure what all of these things are yet, but we'll do that. The third step, which is, in their words, the easiest part, is to now just implement it. You know, you have this on end of data event, pass along some form of handler, and, and we're done here. Uh, and I must admit, I was not happy at this point. Like, this is not, how did Light Neuron work if this is where they started? Uh, and my attempt at asking ChatGPT to draw an owl, it sort of gave me a, a double step one version of the how to draw an owl meme. Uh, we're saying, cool, here's the start, here's the circle, it's a little bit of code that you need to know, uh, and the rest of the owl, you just, just, just draw it. Uh, and the Microsoft documentation was exactly that for me. You know, I know now nothing is literally the state I'm at. Uh, there is a part to say how much I asked ChatGPT actually to do this, but we'll leave that for later. Anyways, get up code search later, I started learning some actual information about how this works. Uh, and we need to focus on that bit that the Microsoft documentation actually points us to, believe it or not, just without a lot of, without a lot of real hints. Um, the on end of data, you need to pass it a class to know how to handle that thing. The, that's, sorry, not a class, a function. That function takes two arguments, there's some sort of event source which you don't need to care about, uh, but then there's one property there, the end of data event arguments, which give you access to the mail body. Now you can ignore all of that code, and just realize that in software over here, we have a strongly typed uh, structure that is an entire email message. I can access the body, the to, the from, headers if I so wish, 
the attachments, the whole thing. Uh, and this is one of the key components of implementing that transport agent. In software, if you're a developer, when you get to this point, you can kind of do what you want now. You can add that annoying, this, sub, this message is from outside, you can add a yellow banner, you know, do what you need to do um, at this point. Okay, I'm gonna change gears now, specifically why is this interesting for, for a light neuron? Uh, and when you read the threat intelligence report from, from ESSET, we sort of learned about two key components about light neuron. The first is this concept of the transport agent, which we've had a light introduction to now. And the second one is another one called the companion DLL. It looks very evil, because it is, uh, but it's, you know, it's just called this companion. Um, and, and to understand how these two things, believe it or not, I'm gonna show you another diagram, they're invoked at different places. You know, we're gonna learn how mail flow works again, but because we now know how transport agents are involved, uh, we might be able to understand how these two components play together. So believe it or not, we've got an incoming message an email that enters exchange, uh, and it might traverse through one of these legitimate transport agents. Maybe it's a DLP thing, so someone doesn't steal your data. Eventually, the transport agent that we would have built, I'm gonna show you that we've built, uh, might get triggered, and some choices need to be made. Now, a really, really sneaky thing, considering that Turla is, like, likes to steal data, they've got their own homegrown rules engine that they've implemented. This is not your Outlook rules that you go, messages from my boss is not important for today. Uh, it's actually a back-end transport agent rule, ag uh, rule engine that can do other things to the message. And it's a programmatic access that they have to that, which is pretty amazing. The version I implemented, uh, it just sort of steals mail. So there's a rule that goes, is the from someone that I'm interested in, yes or no? If it is, include my email address to get a copy of that message. If not, just continue with the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the mail flow. Don't, don't do anything. The second last part before we invoke a companion DLL here goes, is there's some trigger in this message that needs me to know that this message shouldn't actually be delivered. It mustn't go to an intended recipient or not. Uh, you must go do something else. Uh, if it shouldn't, it'll just deliver normally as if nothing happened. Mail will flow normally here if there's nothing weird or something that should trigger the malware at all. If it's not the case, uh, it will process some attachment, which could be PDFs or JPEGs, uh, and we're gonna dive into the PDFs for a second because those are interesting. Uh, and if it's a PDF that it knows what to do with, it's gonna load a DLL off disk. Once the DLL is loaded, we'll dive into this, it's gonna process some form of instruction. What you need to take away from this is there's quite a few steps and things that can happen before we get to the point where this companion DLL is involved. To give you a very quick snippet of what some of those mail rules might look like, uh, this is from the, the asset threat intelligence report. It's similarly how we implemented it. Uh, there's a ton of crafty conditions you can do here. Does the message have this body content? Is it something secret that I'm interested in? Automatically add me as a, as a recipient. Are there links I want to swap out? You know, you can almost anything you can imagine and how I want to manipulate mail that you might trust initially uh, can, can happen with this rule engine. And this is something that's remotely configurable. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the companion DLL because really that's where the meat of the stuff is. Now, the companion DLL effectively receives instructions from something externally, uh, and the instruction from the outside is something that's delivered via email. Now, the way an instruction comes in is not a message that has a subject line that says, please run this command and send me the output. Uh, they're trying to be a little bit sneaky about it. Uh, and the way that happens if I wanted to run a command is it first obviously encrypts the command, but then the second part it does, it uses a steganography technique to embed that encrypted payload inside of a PDF or in a JPEG, in a legitimate one, one that you can view in an image viewer or your PDF viewer like you would. Uh, so it looks something like that. That combined effectively turns into this malicious PDF, something that you can read. It's not an obviously bad message, but there's a payload embedded that's also encrypted inside of it. That is the attachment that needs to enter into exchange to then be read, the payload extracted, and the companion DLL does something with it. But the inverse is true as well. Any responses that need to come back also get encrypted and embedded in a sort of image or a PDF on its way out, back to the attacker to now see what's occurred in this case. Now, if we take all of this stuff you know, into context, we take a step back a little bit, the, the mechanism and the little bits that we need to get this going is lo and behold, we write a little Python C2, of course, it's really just something that can build those PDFs for you really fast uh, and can send email up and down. You send mail into an affected exchange server and one that has this transport agent running knows how to interpret those messages or not. Now, for no lack of diagrams, I'll do one last one, uh, which tries to emphasize a little bit of some of the route back. 
you have an operator, there's an infected exchange server, we've got transport agents that need to be processed, but finally, the infected transport agent is invoked. That transport agent has some decisions it needs to make. Is the rules engine applicable, yes or no, and then do what I need to do? And is the companion DLL involved, yes or no? The companion DLL is involved if the PDF has got an encrypted payload that's got a stegon using a steganography technique inside of it. I repeat myself often. Uh, if needed, uh, and it needs to invoke companion DLL, it would discard that mail, so it's not obvious that mail flowed for someone, which actually has an interesting side effect. The email only needs to enter exchange. It doesn't have to go to Leon at organization. It can go to, this is not a legitimate email, uh, but it'll get discarded before a bounce message or anything like that gets generated, which is quite interesting. Okay, if it must, the companion DLL is loaded, the PDF is unpacked to get the payload, and if a reply needs to go back, this is something I learned about uh, Exchange, uh, a wellform.message file can be dropped in a folder, and this is what uh, Turlo was doing in this case as well, and Exchange would just pick that message up and, and, and forward it along, you know, process the message for that matter. If it needs to go out, it will leave. If it goes to an internal recipient, it would. So uh, this is a lot of a Unix-like thing. Okay, someone suggested I do demos in PowerPoint, so this is gonna be fun, uh, but I wanna show you two videos. Uh, the one's gonna be, what does the command execution look like? Uh, and the second one is, how can we steal email using uh, this malware? Okay, if it doesn't just play, it doesn't just play. Now we do. Uh, the bit we're gonna look at over here, just for some quick context, I've got a lab, of course, on my laptop. This is an exchange installation. Um, I'm gonna show you a little bit on how we're gonna install Light Neuron, and then we're gonna send that email to get some code execution running. So this is an example if we run that initial get transport agent command that um, it lists the default transport agents that exist within Exchange. I haven't done anything yet here. Truthfully, this is a snapshot that I kept reverting to. Uh, I then run a small PowerShell script. This is something a threat actor would have done in some shape or form. They're now infecting an Exchange server, having this transport agent form part of it, and we'll finally see Light Neuron pop up in our list of transport agents now. It can have a priority. I obviously made it number one there, but uh, maybe a more stealthy implementation could be different. I then run a small uh, Python program that connects to an attacker-controlled mailbox. This mailbox is just really what I'm using to get mail in and out, uh, and knows how to build those PDF documents. Finally, there's a shell command option within the, this little C2 that I can invoke a shell command, which will embed it within a PDF that the transport agent knows how to unpack uh, and run. Here, I'm logged into my attacker mailbox. There'll be a draft message. I'm gonna be too slow to read this but you would see that it's just a normal well font message with an attachment that leaves, uh, and the reply comes back, and it could look something like this. It's a response message with a PDF that you can read. I'm using the Outlook Web Access built-in PDF reader over here, but when you go back to our command and control, the response for that command that we've written got extracted out of that PDF, uh, and at this point, I have some command execution. And that is, again, a legitimate SMTP conversation that occurred that had this PDF with this encrypted payload inside of it, you get the gist of it. Okay, now the second part, which admittedly is probably more interesting, uh, is the mail rules engine. So, um, is this it? Nope, that's not it. The video's in PowerPoint. <laughs> uh, we're gonna look at the C2 over here, uh, and what we'll do is, you know, it's my implementation of this rules engine. Um, you can remotely configure the rules and how they must look. Uh, that bar is, Madly annoying. Don't do this if you do a presentation. There we go. Uh, I can add a rule that says, hey, any mail that gets sent to Alice, in this case, I think, forward her mail to, attacker, uh, to the attacker mailbox. Uh, what will happen in this case, that PDF transport mechanism sends a message to transport agent. It goes, hey, cool, I'll add a new rule. So any mail in the future that needs to be changed now gets manipulated. Any responses, um, sorry, and it would respond back with doing that. The command I'm doing over here is just to confirm that the remote transport agent now has that rule applied. It now knows that that's what must happen. I'll now log in using Outlook Web Access to just send an email, uh, as you would expect. The, um, nothing different here. The contents of your mail might be different. This is not a very secret message, but nonetheless. Uh, and I'm gonna send that to Leon. Uh, so nothing really weird here. Off you go. And if I just double check in the send messages, Leon is still the only recipient. Now what you'll see over here, it behaves a lot like a BCC. Uh, except, except that's not what you've done. The next thing I might do is if I log into the recipient mailbox, I now just double check that I received that message. None of this is diff weird, this is still how Exchange behaves, it's very normal. 
Uh, I see the message come in. It's still only for Leon, uh, at least based on the GUI. Uh, but just to double check, I'll look at the message headers. I don't know why it renders awfully in Exchange Web Access, but there you go. Uh, and I'll just double check that is there any references to the attacker over here. And again, it's a lot like a BCC would behave. You, know, you won't, won't necessarily see the stuff, except it's not. So at this point, we confirm, cool, the attacker is not part of this, this message. I didn't send it to attacker. Uh, I sent it to Leon. Uh, but the really cool thing here is if I do log in as the attacker, uh, at that point, assuming I can just type faster, <laughs> we should see a copy of that message that I received. And it still looks exactly the same way that Alice sent to Leon. There's no modification. It's exactly the same thing. And that's because the transport agent triggered that rule going, cool, mail from Alice. I would like a copy of it. Now, you can imagine. You know, having an auto BCC that's not in your Outlook rules and things gets a little complicated over here. Okay, cool. I'll save us a second on that demo. Now, the... <laughs> no? There. You didn't get the second after all. Um, okay, so the detection stuff here is actually really interesting. Honestly, the answers here aren't great. Uh, apart from the fact that I'm quite happy to hear exchange over time will probably just not be a thing anymore. Like, maybe that is the answer over here. Don't, don't care about this because it's maybe not that important anyways. Uh, but I still think academically this is interesting. Um, the first one is the, you know, when I look at how, you know, I've added myself as a recipient, the demo that you just saw, like what opportunities do I have to know that this has happened? Um, a colleague of mine, smarter than me, told me about this PowerShell commandlet. Oh my goodness. Don't do videos in PowerPoint. Um, saying, hey, you can run this command get message tracking log for a message ID to get a trace of how a message flowed through Exchange, right? The message ID I grabbed from the test message that I sent, and it would look something like this. And that is a lot to read. But if you dive into the detail a little bit, you'll notice, okay, there's this one line entry that specifically talks about an agent that did something to a message. Uh, and I infer that, it's not clear to me, I infer it by the fact that the recipients have now changed. Not, I have added a recipient. Uh, and the hint over here is, you know, that line of code you see at the top is actually the implementation. I'm adding a new to uh, recipient to the message. Not a BCC, a to. Now, you know, the hard question here is, is the expectation then for, for detecting this that I need to pull a message tracking log for every message and then infer... Uh, yeah, I don't really know what to, what to tell you from that perspective. So, so that's, really, that's really tricky. The second part, and maybe more relevant to how Turla operated, is what if I wanted to change how this message worked, uh, the content of the message? And maybe I just wanted to tamper with the subject. Uh, because I can do that in code, I can go mail.message.subject equals something else. I can run my get message tracking log command, uh, PowerShell commandlet again and see what the results might be. Uh, and when we inspect the detail over here, you sort of sits in this situation where there's no clear line that says an agent changed the, the, um, the subject. Uh, in fact, it's roughly around the SMTP component, which I'm not too sure what that means, that, uh, that tells you, based on the message subject field changing, that it's been changed. But had the body, you know, what if the body was changed? What do you see there? I don't know. Uh, and I think this is, a, this is quite a tricky one. Part of why this kind of malware is probably not, not a lot of fun to deal with. Anyways, so as far as the full, the full spectrum here goes from the purple teaming context and how Turla operated, this was sort of like enough for us to implement and get a sense of, you know, when we do these kinds of attacks, what opportunities for detection exist or which existing ones can be strengthened to, to improve some of that detection. But for me, that wasn't enough. Uh, Cobble Strike is <laughs> maybe now a notorious C2 for many, many reasons. Uh, I, I like gluing it to things, and I thought to myself, how can I glue Cobble Strike into this, into this conversation? Is there, is there something we can do over here to have it work via this backdoor? And that's exactly what I, uh, what I set out to do. Now, the way that's work, that works, I'm going to do a quick command and control 101. It'll be very quick, but um, you need to understand that to know how Lightroom would fit in. Now, a very basic command and control setup would be there'll be some sort of controlling server, in this case, Cobalt Strike, and there'll be some sort of implant or a beacon or whatever. And those two communicate over a C2 path, very commonly an HTTP request. I make a request to a server, it tells me I must do something, I do it, and I send the request back again. Uh, but Cobalt Strike has a feature called external C2, which sort of gives you control over that C2 path so that you now introduce this new concept of a client and a controller. And those are parts you can write outside of Cobalt Strike. It's sort of a framework where you can interact programmatically with Cobalt Strike, but also interact with a beacon programmatically. 
And when I thought about this a little bit, the part that I really want to change is that C2 pass should turn now into email, right? This light neuron thing that I already have is already, you know, it's part of it. I just need to glue this in. In fact, then when I think even further, I already have all the bits I need. I've written a C2 part, which replaces the controller, and I've already got the transport agent, which is the client to the beacon. It's really just a little bit of plumbing to connect these two together so that they can relay frames between each other. Uh, but to get that beacon running at first, uh, I'm going to show you how that staging process works as a way to sort of visualize how these mails will flow and where some of my problems might come in. So to understand how a beacon would stage, let's, let's have a look at this at a high level. Uh, and this is a little bit of an unveiling when you read the external C2 documentation. Like, how does this work? This, this diagram should hopefully help. The first bit you need to do is you need to make a TCP connection to the Kobold Strike server, the external C2 listener that you would have started. Once you're connected, you'll ask for some shell code, which is a defined protocol and how that works, and it will reply with that shell code back. And this is some shell code I now have in my C2. And I'll plonk that into a PDF, I email it off to my victim, and the transport agent knows that this PDF and the way this frame looks is something, it contains a Kerbal Strike beacon and I need to, need to spawn that. For the defenders in the room, you'll probably get excited over here, there's a lot of opportunity uh, in this step. But finally, that transport agent will spawn this beacon, which will now come up, and at that point, we'll have a Windows name pipe open that we can connect to and interact with that beacon, right? Uh, and at this point, we have this, and this is my favorite slide, this opportunity to have this frame relaying happening between Cobalt Strike and the beacon. You know, there's a lot of complexity in the middle, but the way this protocol works is I have a frame from Cobalt Strike, I need to relay it, doesn't matter how, I'm using external C2 as a feature to get it to the other side, send it into the beacon, and whatever the response is, I do the same mechanism to get it back. It's genuinely a really cool thing to, to play with. Uh, but unfortunately for me, as cool as it is, it definitely didn't work, and I lost about four days of my life uh, thinking I'm smarter than I, than I actually am. Uh, and to understand this problem I sort of st uh, got, we need to take a little bit of a closer look at those frames. The, the specification tells you you just need to throw the frames around between the C2 and the beacon. You don't really need to know what's inside. For the most part, that's true, uh, but there's some detail in that. Now, if we had to look at the staging process again, what, uh, what would happen at a, um, at a socket level, you would ask for shell code, Cobalt Strike will reply with a f what I'm gonna call a frame from here. Every time I mean a, a frame, it's gonna be this communication between Cobalt Strike and a beacon. A frame will come back from Cobalt Strike saying this is the length and this is the data. And the very first frame, as you can imagine, if you ask for shell code, is a shell code frame. It contains that full body. That shell code gets shipped all the way back to an exchange server, or it could be another server you can remotely connect to a name pipe, um, and it gets staged. And then what the protocol tells you, what the specification says, once that beacon is up, you connect to the name pipe, and you read a metadata frame of it. That first frame that comes off is a metadata frame. And that response is a very small 132 bytes. That 132 bytes, using this very short email circuit, gets sent back to Cobalt Strike. That's the staging process complete. At this point, once we're staged, we now start pinging and ponging between each other, and if there's no instruction ready for us to do anything with, both sides will just reply with a one byte up and down. That's it, ping pong all day long. Uh, that rhymed unexpectedly. <laughs> the, <laughs> uh, more importantly, this is not something that needs to happen in the interval. You control the C2 channel, you can control how fast that happens. If it's once a day, once a month, once a week, legitimately true for, for some operations, then uh, that's something that you can control, which is quite exciting. Okay, now imagine all of that worked, and you've used Cobalt Strike before, you sort of get this beacon that checks in. Now, roughly at this point, you do a cartwheel and you ring a shell bell in the office because clearly code execution just occurred, uh, and it's a bit of a euphoria. Uh, and then depending on how long you've been doing this, your first instinct would be to right-click that beacon and interact, and you just hit Alice or some command. You, know, you just want some output for the thing that you've done which is obviously exactly what I did in my lab environment. Uh, but the problem is, and we're looking at the frames a little bit, I would send that LS, which now results in not a one byte frame going to the beacon, but a 48 byte frame, because it's got an instruction for the beacon to do, uh, and it would reply with a one byte response. <laughs> now, I don't know how big your whatever directory is, but one byte's not enough to know what's going on. Uh, I realize I don't have enough time, but Yo. <laughs> this was uh, four days of 
Pure Pain. ChatGPT is not great. The, uh, yeah, the, the only thing that worked over here was, uh, was turning into reading some more documentation and knowing what happened. I'm resisting emotionally responding to the four days that I had trying to figure this out. Uh, maybe not so well. But anyways, this is one line in there that talks about the third-party client controller. And it says when a new session is desired, the third-party controller connects to the external C2 server. Cool. The little Python thing we have, we connect to the external C2 server. But then there's this line that if you don't read it properly, you'll spend four days wasting your time. <laughs> it says each connection to the external C2 server services one session. Okay? The connection from the C2 server services one session. Now, when you implement this in a very short period of time, you're like, cool, I've got my session, I'm ready. What you don't realize is they're also talking about the beacon in this case. If you disconnect, there's a new session. And to help explain what I mean by this, I'm going to introduce what I'm calling the single session problem. I made this up. Um, you've seen this uh, PDF that's got this gobbledygook inside of it that the transport agent knows how to do. Um, and when an email comes in, believe it or not, there's a transport agent process that as a new child will finally kick off your transport agent. So mail comes in, there's this transport agent process, it realizes there's this list of transport agents I need to invoke, Light Neuron is one of them. And Light Neuron will at some stage run a constructor. It's C-sharp code, there's a class that needs to be initialized, a constructor is run. Then there's some logic that says, cool, this is a PDF, it's got a nasty payload in it. Uh, I know someone who knows who can do something about that. Uh, and it will invoke the companion. And the companion gets initialized now. There's sort of this tree that builds. Uh, and the companion knows, oh, this is a cobble strike frame. It's pretty cool, I've already got one up and going. There's this name pipe that I'm aware of. So I'm just going to connect to the name pipe. The frame I got from Cobalt Strike, I'm going to write on the pipe back into the beacon. When I'm done with the writing, I'm going to read whatever the response is, dump that new PDF of mine in the spool folder, and then a cleanup process starts. Companion DLL starts destructing, and finally the transport agent that I have starts destructing. And the nuance here is that means my connection to my name pipe just got destroyed. Every time I come back, a new message enters the system. This process repeats itself. <laughs> the C2 specification says when you connect, you need to read the metadata frame off first, not write whatever you have and read whatever you got. It's why when 48 bytes come in, one byte comes out. It's time for the pong. There's nothing to do over here. Wow. <laughs> Four days. OK, anyways. the. Um, what this meant, there's a ton of ways I thought, how can I solve this? Um, uh, and one of the ways that I figured I would do that is, of course, an excuse for another proxy. So I built this project called Beacon Pipe Frame Proxy. It's a toy proxy. The idea being, I needed something to stay connected to that beacon. The transport agent keeps dying. Now that I know that. Uh, the beacon, uh, my proxy doesn't need to die, but I need a mechanism to keep a client connected to the beacon while allowing things that can come and go on the other end which is what this proxy tries to do. So the TLDR of this proxy is obviously more code than this, but it starts a TCP socket listener. It connects with the name pipe down to the beacon and has this very simple while loop that says a new TCP connection comes in using the existing name pipe client. This is the most important thing to take from that. Write whatever you got and read whatever you got back. At this point, that session stays alive like the spec told us in the first place, uh, and we can now continue normally. Which means the way this whole thing is put together now actually introduces yet another step uh, where we insert the frame proxy right in the middle over there. The beacon is long lived, the proxy is long lived. We're not talking offset considerations here, that's up to you. But um, you know, at this point, the transport agent can come and go and distract, it's fine, the communication will stay alive. Which means now when that 48 byte Alice comes in, I don't get a one byte lie, uh, I get a 676 byte response that I can actually do something with. So I'm going to show you a demo of that, uh, which is again in PowerPoint. Good luck to me. Uh, we'll look at the C2 over here. There's going to be a few things going. We're going to connect to Cobalt Strike. We're going to spawn the beacon. Um, so I'm going to talk you through that. In this case over here, uh, I'm going to play. You're looking at the C2, praying that that little bar goes away. Go away, little bar. Uh, we'll connect the, the first command I'll issue here is the CS Connect, which is just going to connect my little C2 controller to Cobalt Strike. And this is using that external C2 protocol. Uh, I'm making sure I have an external C2 listener, which is what I have over here. And I'll go ahead and issue that, that connect uh, instruction. Once that's ready, uh, with it connected, I can now request uh, some shell code. So silly command just to get something for a specific architecture. 
uh, which is 64-bit in this case, uh, and I'm going to use a, a create remote thread technique to spawn Notepad and just inject a COBOL strike beacon inside of that thread. What happens at this point is the, code, the shell code got requested, the PDF got built, and it got shipped off to Exchange in quite a, quite a sick, quick succession. If we look at Exchange itself, I need to look closer. You'll see the, the transport agent has, has a child process that spawns, which is going to be that Notepad. At some stage, the proxy will come up as well, which is what I'm looking at over there. Uh, the left was just some debug logging of the frames. At uh, the moment all of that stuff is up, that initial metadata frame will come all the way back into Cobalt Strike, and we have that initial beacon. Uh, and this is now the cartwheel uh, scenario. Uh, with the proxy in place, I now interact, uh, and when I issue an LS for the contents of the C drive, the response is not nothing, which definitely hurt my soul. Uh, it's uh, a much larger response. There's just to show some of the ping pongs that go up, uh, and finally we have that 600 plus byte response, uh, and something visually showing that it works, if the video does its two second thing, and there we go. Uh, an interactive global strike beacon over exchange. Okay. <laughs> so, in summary, <laughs> to fuse light neuron and cobalt strike, you just need 10 quick things. <laughs> cobalt strike, a Python C2, a dodgy email, actually an attachment, onto an email, entering exchange that will spawn a transport agent that would load the companion DLL that would read that PDF to see what's going on inside of it, connect to my dodgy proxy, and finally relay the frame back into Cobalt Strike. And four days. And four days, <laughs> absolutely. That's what I wanted to show you. Thank you so much for, for listening. <laughs>